Right, people still joining, but um, we'll make a start. And thank you very much for coming to, um, I think this is the fifth webinar that we've hosted. Um, and one of our, we see one of our purposes at West Country Voices as um, creating fora in which people can discuss the burning issues of the day. And really human rights is right up there now. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel that we're all very blase about our rights. Um, and we use phrases like, I know my rights, but do we? Do we? And do we know what's under threat from this government in terms of its policies? I mean, we've had, we've lost our right to freedom of movement, our right to protest is being curtailed. Um, under the elections bill, some people's right to vote will be seriously impacted. And you've got Liz Truss um, in the sort of uh, arms war of who can be the, the most evil at the moment, saying that she wants to remove the right to strike, um, whereas under the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to belong to a union and the right to withdraw your labour is a pretty fundamental right. So it feels like a very good time um, to be discussing this very hot issue. So the format for the evening is basically I'm going to ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their organisation, and explain what their areas of particular concern are. And then I'm going to ask you, please, if you've got questions, to write them in the chat, preface them with question, and we'll monitor that and make sure that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip and that um, we get through as many questions as possible. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to ado, adieu. Uh, Going a bit loopy already. Um, I'd like to hand over to Mark Thomas from the 99% organization to talk, uh, to introduce himself. Please, Mark, thank you. Well, thank you, Anthea. Uh, yes, so my name's Mark Thomas, as Anthea said. I'm uh, from the 99% organization, which is a relatively new organization founded just in 2019, whose objective is to prevent mass impoverishment in the United Kingdom. And the reason that I am uh, concerned about human rights is that um, we have a government which fundamentally doesn't believe in human rights. Um, most of the members of the cabinet are market fundamentalists whose belief is that the best way to allocate all resources is through the market. So that includes resources like things that uh, under, for example, the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights we have a right to, like food, clothes and housing, that should all be allocated through the market, ideally with no government interference. Healthcare, according to them, should be allocated through the market without government interference. Education should be allocated through the market without government interference. And if you take that literally, it means very, very simply this that you have a right to what you can afford to pay for and you have no rights to anything else. So that is the reason I'm concerned. Uh, that's probably enough for me to start with. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now turn to Carl Roscoe from Best for Britain. Hi there. Um, my name is Carl Roscoe. Um, I'm from an organisation called Best for Britain. Um, some of you will probably have heard of us. I'm sure there are people on this call who've supported us. So first of all, thank you. For anybody who doesn't know who we are, um, we have been around for a bit. We were originally set up uh, to try and secure a second referendum. But after the 2019 general election, it didn't feel like the moment to stop campaigning on issues. It didn't feel like things were getting any better. If anything, they were getting much worse. We, our, our objective really is to, sort, to support politicians political parties and individuals who share our values, our values around internationalism. And we also set out to persuade those who might disagree with us up to a point. Um, but eventually, as we get closer to an election, I can see us in a situation where we will be putting all of the emphasis, well, all of our energy will be going into to getting a different government uh, because this government just doesn't share our values. Um, and that's pretty evident from the onslaught of legislation that there has been this bill is one of many, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to have questions about how these, um, in, you know, are interoperable with each other and, and what the, the consequences of that are. Um, 
Best of Britain didn't set out to be an explicitly anti-Tory organisation. Um, it's it set out with a, you know, with a set of values, but it is a de facto anti-Tory organisation now, just based on, on the direction that, that we're going in. Um, I'm, uh, the, some of the biggest concerns we've got for the, this bill in particular are the impact it will have uh, on, on immigration. And already we've seen nasty situations. There's an increased number of people who are subject to challenging immigration decisions now with the settled status and all of those EU citizens. There are mistakes that will be made by the Home Office and, and everything else. So this bill, is that's one area that is particularly pertinent to what Press for Britain's done, but the wider impact uh, on what this will mean for citizens and democracy um, is, is pretty huge and unseen in, in, a, in a European country like the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Carl. If I could just turn to Daniel now as the final panellist. Hi, so I'm Daniel Sohage, and thank you, thank you for having me on. I'm the director of an organisation called Stand for All. We're a refugee and migrants' rights organisation. We work with other organisations, other charities, give them pro bono advice on how to campaign, policy, that side of things. So we focus quite heavily on the human rights aspect of this and how it relates to refugees. Obviously, we've seen during earlier stages of the conservative leadership campaign, how the ECHR has been used as an argument why we need to leave it, specifically related to the Rwanda deal and harsher measures to impose on refugees and asylum seekers crossing the channel. Um, there's a number of different issues in it which really raise concerns. The um, permission stage that they want to bring in will set such a high bar for people that they have to show grounds to significant debt their health and their circumstances before they will even reach a case and be tried under human rights. When it comes to deportations, they are increasing the threshold to make it harder for people to argue against deportation via human rights cases. So these are all things which all tie in, but they're also quite long running things, which uh, there's been some of you may remember Theresa May many years back arguing they couldn't deport somebody because they had a cat. So this has been building up and building up for a very long time. And this seems to be the latest push to really hit using human rights to harm refugees in general. But in so doing, they're undermining everybody's ability to access human rights. And this has all sorts of knock on effects. Um, children who uh, traffic from overseas, for example, go, go through age assessment. It makes it harder for them to appeal those age assessments, which increases the chance of actually young children under the age of 18 being held in adult facilities, even deported to Rwanda if that policy goes ahead. So there's a wider implications, wider issues to take on, not just refugees from our point of view, but the knock-on effects that this could have just in general for weakening human rights. And that's from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wonder if I can start with a rather big general question. Um, and it kind of links back to what Daniel was just saying, which is that the, the, the focus and a lot of the assumptions of people who read about human rights are, are, I think, that it is about migrants. That's what human rights is about. But we also know from surveys that have been done that, that the vast majority of people aren't bothered about immigration. Actually, it's not a major concern at all. It is a concern of a very narrow group of blue kip members, basically. Why is why do you think this government is prepared to die or fight on this hill? Don't know who'd like to take that first. Cal, I'm muted. Okay. I'll um I'll have a I'll have a go. And that, look, that this is one uh, possible and ex explanation. I'm sure there are many many others. Um, I it certainly is clear that with all of the legislation and almost any anything that this government does, it's it's continuously been in campaigning mode, not in governing mode. They are constant campaigners. Any opportunity to drive a wedge between people, uh, they take it. Um, and large in every single bill, there's something to almost distract campaigns like us and sort of get other things through under the carpet and, and other things they can stick on a leaflet or put it, you know, make a huge song and dance about in the press. 
that will get people very exercised and worked up. Um, and uh, you know, not to say all of the very legitimate and dangerous uh, problems that will come with most of the, these pieces of legislation. Um, but the reason I think for, for that they will use this and some of these bills are a very, very useful tool to speak to that core of people who do care about these things. And that's because of the voting system we've got. You know, they can win an election on such a small percentage of people, as long as you keep your, well, in their case, it's roughly 40%, isn't it? As long as you've got their, their supporters, their conservative voters, constantly going through the same culture war and feeling like their values are under attack and they, they can solidify, um, their results in any election. That's just that's just one theory, but I think that the vote, we've got to remember the first past the post voting system has a huge part to play in why this this tactic works. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, who else would like to come in, Mark? Well, yes, uh, I I agree. I I think this government uh, absolutely is in permanent campaigning mode. I think. Um, we are re we really haven't got our minds around what this government is and, and how it operates. Um, and it, the government has both policies and pseudo policies. So there are things they make a lot of noise about because they play well, but they have no intention of doing like leveling up. They, they will not do any leveling up. None of, none of the, the actions they've taken would result in leveling up will result in further leveling down. Most people in this country are poorer now than they were in 2007. We haven't had a period with that kind of uh, mass impoverishment since the 1820s. And one of the things that they need to do is constantly to distract people from the reality of what's happening to themselves in their own lives. And unfortunately, I think racism is a card which is quite good for distracting um, a small minority of people, but not that small, big enough to be worth something electorally and big enough to muddy the water in terms of people debating what's really going on. So I agree with, with Cal, basically. Thank you. Daniel? Um, well, I agree with both Cal and Mark on that, but I think there's something, it's a, I think it actually goes deeper than that. If you look at the language that you use, oh, for about the last year or more, of uh, activist lawyers, for example. It's a very concerted narrative. They know that they lose in courts, and they know they lose in courts regularly. So, and you look at when these stories come out, it's when something else has already happened. So we saw, for example, with Partygate, that hit the news, and within days after that, Rwanda was brought up. So there is a constant sort of, They've got it in their back pocket at all times that don't actually want to solve this. We don't want to do anything about this, but it makes a nice big splash as soon as we do it. We know that everybody like ourselves will automatically come out and start talking about it and say, well, no, you can't do this. This is hideous. So this new cycle gets taken away from whatever it is they're trying to distract from and they can then move on. And it's just most of the time just complete deflection because they know that it can't actually push through. All it, will, it will take a significant amount of opposition, but they don't mind the opposition because they are appealing to, there's the old line in communications, that you appeal to the one person who shouts loudest as opposed to the hundred who stay silent. So they're looking at the people who are shouting the loudest, which for them and their members are the, actually a minority even of conservative members who view channel crossings, refugees and immigration as a significant issue. So it's all part of a longer term game to just distract from everything else, really, and not have to do anything, not have to govern. And would you, um, I just want just a couple of things. I just want to remind people, please, if you could switch your videos off so it's just the speakers who are on video, that would really help. Thank you very much. And if you've got questions, could you type them in the chat and preface them with question so that we, we pick it up? Thank you. Um, I wanted to also to have a look at you know what Liz Truss is saying today about worker rights, and wondering if you've got some comments on that. Is that another dog whistle, or is that genuine? Do you think? 
Uh, well, I think it's genuine in that they don't really believe in worker rights. Uh, if, if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, there's only one of the things in there which this government is really concerned about, that is property rights. They regard property rights as absolute. They don't really believe, and some of them have even said it, Dominic Raab has been caught on camera saying he doesn't really believe in, hu in human and economic rights. Uh, but he's not the only one. If you're a market fundamentalist, the, really the only right you do believe in is property rights. So if, if I'm very wealthy, nobody should be taxing me. That would be an infringement of my rights. But, um, and therefore, you know, my being taxed in order to pay for somebody else's cancer treatment, that would also be uh, against my property rights. That's the only right they're they are keen to protect. Now, if you allow workers to bargain for a fair wage, that's actually going to reduce the wealth of the, the market fundamentalists and the donors behind them, um, because the, the, the wage share of GDP goes up and the profit share goes down. They do not want to see that. So I think it's, it's genuine in that sense of the word genuine. It's not very good news for most people in this country, of course. If I can just come in on that. So, um, just to support what Mark's saying, but I think we have to take it as genuine based on Kwasi Kwarteng, who was last week, signing in that if in strike action, you can bring in agency workers, for example, to undermine mm -hmm. the strike action. So even without these changes, we're already seeing this process taking place and the weakening taking place. And with Liz Truss in particular, if you look at her tax plan, for example, um, one of the only economists who supports it is Patrick Menfield, who's been widely debunked in a lot of different ways. And he came out and said that, well, it will necessitate 7% interest, which that will harm small businesses and uh, mortgage holders, of course, but it's good for the people with savings. And that tells you exactly who they're looking at. They're looking at the people who aren't going to be hit by a 7% rise in their mortgage cost and are benefiting from savings or benefiting larger companies when the small ones go out of business. So these, that, this is where I think we have a really take them seriously because they are very focused on these measures, which will overall damage workers' rights. And um, just a couple of days ago, Kwasi Kwarteng quoted, uh, uh, made a tweet with a very revealing comment. He said, yesterday, this was a criminal offence. Today, it's an option for business. Now, if you think about that, if you've got a government which is taking things that used to be a criminal offence and making them an option for business, you can see what the, the, the direction of travel. And it's, it's very, very scary. And up until fairly recently, this, this has been quiet, but now they're saying the quiet part out loud. I do think just to <clears throat> a slightly alternative view, and I, you know, I could be proven wrong. Today seems to have been a, a big day for Liz Trust to to give policies. I suspect that the, the strikes and the workers' rights are the most likely to come to fruition. But uh, in addition to that, I think we should look at this in the context of um, ordering the police to 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 cut, I think, crime or murder specifically by twenty percent, which sort of <laughs> is, is an interesting policy because I, I you know if, if you could just wave a magic wand and make that happen I'm sure anybody would do that um, and also uh, there were other other policies that she announced about cat calling and wolf whistling in the street one of the things I have noticed is government does like to leak things out or throw enough mess at the wall and see what sticks um, and then of course YouGov or any other polling organisation will help them a little bit by, by asking a snap poll question about some of this, and then they can get a bit of an idea about what might be the sort of the, the germ of a, of a policy idea. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I think let's let's see with, with which of these actually become what Liz Truss, if she becomes Prime Minister, does. But yeah, I, I, I suspect that the workers' rights are probably the easiest and the cheapest to do, and ideologically very appealing to, to their base. Mm. I, don't, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that within the, the proposals, there's a, there are measures to prevent judges from striking down secondary legislation. And I, I wondered if, if any of you have any feedback from the courts and, and judges about how they view these um, encroachments on their powers. 
I mean, I, I think uh, th this government has not been very systematic about anything except for eroding democratic safeguards. And they've been remarkably systematic on that. And so, uh, yes, they've, they've been reducing the uh, powers of the courts. The ability of the courts to uh, conduct judicial reviews is under threat. But so are so many other things. So each piece of legislation is an attack on our human rights. The elections bill you mentioned in your introduction, Anthea, it, um, until recently, we had an independent elections regulator that would say, are our uh, <coughs> elections free and fair? Now that um, elections re regulator, which still says on its website that it's in independent, but it now reports to ministers. So ministers will actually be deciding whether our elections are free and fair. That's, that's a huge step. The voter ID point that you made, where it's been carefully crafted so that, uh, for example, a young person's rail card doesn't count as photo ID, a pensioner's bus pass does count as free ID, and you don't have to be a genius to work out why they framed it that way. Uh, <clears throat> the police bill, you, I think you also mentioned that one, which means that we no longer have a, an absolute right to peaceful protest, which it makes us a very unusual country in Europe, not having that right, puts us in, in the line with Hungary, but not, not very many others at all. Um, uh, they've, uh, they're, they're obviously uh, very happy to breach international law. They've found ways to dodge parliamentary scrutiny. They've even tried to prorogue pro parliament. And that's one of the reasons they want to curb the power of the courts, because it was the su Supreme Court that said that was illegal. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of our social contract uh, uh, after the Second World War, uh, the Beveridge Report set out to tackle these five giants, uh, including illness. And um, we've, we've now got a Health Act, which is... Um, which gives ministers all the powers they need to migrate the NHS towards something very much like the uh, US system, which it will still be called the NHS, but in practice, we won't have an unfettered right to free healthcare. It'll, it'll become very much a, um, a uh, second best service and people will be squeezed out into the private sector which will be ruinously expensive. In the US, two thirds of personal bankruptcies come from that. So our right not to go bankrupt in order to stay healthy is being eroded. So, so it's not just the courts, it's actually um, a very, very systematic attack on, on virtually everything except property rights. Yeah, so part of, the, part of the agenda too seems to be opening up other avenues for people to make money. Yes, absolutely. Out of, out of, out of the system. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing with the NHS bill, that if we did have the American system, it would be far worse for patients, it would be far worse for taxpayers, it would be vastly better for providers. It would be about, we've estimated, about a £28 billion profit opportunity, £28 billion every single year. So that, you can see why they would choose to move towards what is, in effect, the worst healthcare system of any developed country. It's not for the benefit of the population, it's purely for the benefit of the providers. I noted they, they, they cited numbers for how much they spend on health, including the test, track and trace that they'd, 37 billion that had been squandered and everything. So worry, people have been given a very distorted picture of what money is spent. Yes, I think the BMA did a, um, a, a proper study uh, of uh, the relative costs of healthcare in the UK and concluded that we are spending less than other OECD countries. And if we want good healthcare outcomes, we should be prepared to spend in line with other civilized countries. Uh, what will end up happening is that government spending will probably not decrease. If you look in the States, government spending on healthcare is about the same as ours, but that's more than matched by the amount in the private sector. So they spend more than double what we spend in total and they get worse healthcare outcomes and they have uh, this extraordinary number of medical bankruptcies. Cal, your organisation is close to quite a lot of politicians. What, what, what sort of vibes are you picking up from them? Is there any disquiet amongst Conservative ranks about the direction well, of travel? 
there, do you, there is. So, I mean, David Davis has been pretty clear on this already. I mean, he has been uh, in some ways uh, better on some of this for some of the other legislation and some of the other bills too, even on the election bill when it comes to, mm. to voter ID as well. We, Best for Britain and all of the other organisations that we work very closely with, we, we have found success in, in the House of Lords. When you speak to Conservative peers, you can you can have a much more sensible conversation. And especially if something is, um, uh, is seen to be at odds with what they might have promised in their manifesto, it's a way of having a conversation saying, look, you didn't even promise this, should you be doing this? But beyond this, there are Conservatives who... Uh, if if they don't believe in overreach of the state, this is fairly incompatible ideologically because most of the changes, as as I see it, and I'm I'm not I'm not a lawyer, I'm more of a campaigner, but most of this actually, the essential bits of the human rights or the difference between the Human Rights Act and this Bill of Rights are not hugely different. It's about whether you can bring a case against a public body, um, and that is really quite a lot of overreach by the state. So I do think that there is, there are arguments and framed in the right way, building support among Conservative supporters, Tory voters, or the Conservative peers is possible. Um, we, we, we did see some disquiet on the other pieces of legislation, but obviously at the moment with a very large majority, it is, these are smaller wins, these are not big wins. Um, but I, I do think those arguments are there uh, for on the overreach of the state. And what do we do when the Lords takes action, for example, as they did very effectively on the Police Crime Courts and Sentencing Bill and threw out a whole load of things only for Patel to bring them all back again in a police yeah. bill? It's right. It is right. I mean, I think that unfortunately the, the number of, of successes that we can claim are, are small on all of those, on all of those pieces of legislation. Um, and there, I mean, the other thing that before getting too despondent, and I think nobody's going to sit here, I should imagine all the people on this call are not going to be content with doing nothing. And I think the more that we can do, you know, if we can even try to, to prevent the most damaging wording, making it into a piece of, of legislation, then we must. But the, the government is not remembering, and I think there is a history of Conservative governments doing this, not remembering that they might not always be in power. And it is a mistake. It is a mistake to to legislate in this way, presuming you will always be in government because mm. you may not be in future. Um, and then anybody else, um, uh, hopefully, a, you know, a, a Labour or, you know, coalition government of, 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 of progressive parties will be in power at some stage in the future. They will have a long list of things to undo, but there are some things that they may not undo and may not want to undo. And the Conservatives may come to regret some of these decisions. Um, so I think we we do have to remember that as long as the elections bill hasn't completely stymied our attempts to, to, to change the government, that some of this may well, well, the Conservatives will come to regret it. Yeah. I think at West Country Voices, one of the things that bothers us as we're writing is that the Overton windows keep mm. getting stretched and stretched and stretched. And we find ourselves you know, almost accepting things that a year ago would have been unthinkable. I mean, not we, not those of us, you know, who are obviously in the thick mm. of it and campaigning, but that people generally are being softened up to say, oh, well, you know, yeah, there's that, but it doesn't affect me or it's acceptable. And uh, perhaps this is a good opportunity as we, our audience is very, very remarkably silent. I'd love some questions. Um, is to just talk a little bit about what we can do to a educate people, mobilise people, and stand up to this um, increasingly authoritarian government? Um, if I can just come on that, because it also ties in with what Cal was just saying. Uh, people tend to vote and, in general, go for things that they feel personally affect them. Most people are more interested, understandably, if if I hit the light switch, the lights come on. If I turn the tap, the water's going to come on. Can I pay the mortgage? Can I pay the bills? That's why immigration and refugees, for example, actually tend to be quite low down. But they do also vote based on values. And we saw during the Borders and Nationality Bill, for example, in the law, that a lot of older, more traditional conservatives were some of the most vocal critics of it, including, I can't remember the Lord the Pair's name off the top of my head, which is terrible but a Conservative peer of long standing stating pretty much exactly what Cal's just said. 
you do not give powers to yourself that you would not want an opposition government to have. So these views are still held, <clears throat> and they'll be held by conservative voters as well. So there needs to be that focus of we're talking to everybody about, like, these are the issues, this is why it's wrong. The Conservative Party in particular has been running scared of Nigel Farage for quite some time because he's very loud and but he doesn't actually have that support now that Brexit's taken place. That was a mobilising factor for people that they could unify behind. They haven't got that at the moment. And they're still trying to scrape down, trying to find it. So if we look at the individual issues and how they go against people's personal values, then you start to see that actually there's far more that you can work with people on and can bring them around on. And that's, I think, where the Achilles heel of the parties it stands they're shouting about a very small number of things that people don't care about for the most part, but not doing anything to tackle the things that people do care about, such as the cost of living crisis. And as people see that that's happened, you show that that's happened, show that, well, actually, look, they're shouting about this Rwanda deal, but how does that help you? Whereas they're not doing anything to help cost of living. That's when you can start to bring them back and shift the overall back the other way. Mm -hmm. An interesting tactic, yes. Um, Carl, because of you. Well, yes, no, and so, I mean, this is going to sound like a shameless plug for Best of Britain, but I would say that one of the things we can do, do sign up to get the updates from, from us, because a lot of the time, when it's time to take an action, when there's a moment in a piece of legislation, um, you know, what we've done in the past is we've managed to mobilise people quickly, whether that's been a case of emailing people directly in the House of Lords or speaking to their own MPs and making sure any research that we've been given or any other messaging that we've found works well with other Conservatives or, or even with, with cross-central Labour peers, make sure that, that gets into the hands of the right people um, at the right moment before a vote. Um, so that's that's the only reason I say do sign up to our mailing list because sometimes it can be a matter of hours and and actually um, that's the that's the moment to seize upon and it's how we we did manage to get some some things taken out of the policing bill and the elections bill. I think one thing um, it, it it is easy to get despondent because uh, oh, this government does behave differently from previous governments. It has essentially no shame and, and no morality and therefore things that used to work and used to be effective like getting a petition with a hundred thousand signatures um, they're very happy to ignore it and it's it is very easy and they, uh, uh, as a couple of people have said they're, they're very happy to ignore um, the house of lords the house of lords with the nhs bill um, we had a campaign and we managed to get a lot of very good amendments put in by the House of Lords, all but one of which was then rejected. Um, had the Lords amendments been accepted, the bill would have actually not been too bad, but as it is, it, it's a terrible bill. So it is easy to become despondent, but on the other hand, um, over the last few years, the, this government has made about 40 U-turns. So it's not that nothing will change their minds, it's just that a lot of the things that we used to think would change their minds, will change their minds. Um, we've seen actually that they are very concerned about holding onto their seats because we've had swings in certain by-elections for seats that were regarded as completely safe seats. Some of them had, since inception, some of them had always returned a conservative and some of these were majorities of 23, 24, 25,000. But when uh, people, uh, locally understood what was going on, uh, for example, with North Shropshire, when they understood the degree of corruption that um, had been um, uh, going on, the, the egregious breaches of the anti-lobbying rule, as the Standards Commissioner put it, um, then, uh, first of all, Owen Patterson was forced to resign, but secondly, his attempted replacement lost that seat. So, so they know there's no such thing as a safe seat. Uh, that is very worrying to them. And I think politicians of all parties worry when they get letters from constituents, especially if it's what they call not the usual suspects. So every, every MP has a handful of people who write every week ranting letters saying, you know, 
I'm never going to vote for you. Then, of course, they ignore them because they know these people are never going to vote for them anyway. But if they get a letter from somebody that says, I've always voted Conservative, but this government does not represent traditional conservative principles. It doesn't have any respect for the law law and order. It's not one nation. It doesn't tell the truth. It's not even small c conservative. It's extremely radical. It's ideological. It's not pragmatic. Uh, and you know it's not a traditional Tory thing. And so I'm not going to vote for you. They get very, very worried by that sort of thing. So I think uh, the answer is not to give up, but the answer is to be much more innovative. Uh, and to find out what, what has been working over the last three years, which is quite often different things from what, what was working in the past, and focus very hard on those. If I might just add, add to that, Mark, what we, we found is that people, if for, for Conservative MPs, whether they're new 2019 intake or, or much more established, a letter to the local paper in the constituency is all is in some cases more effective than a letter to you know from the same old voices you're absolutely right that after a while MPs will disregard message you know messages they get from the same person whereas a new voice and that is appearing in the paper and being seen by many 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 poor people many more more people across the constituency really they take they take notice and a bit of panic sets in and that can be very very useful um, and we found that a combination of finding the right moment to get some of our supporters to write letters to the local to local papers in the right parts of the country, as well as our, our public affairs team having uh, sending them a, the latest polling, because you're right, mm. they are worried about their seats. You mm. can create that sense, and at least then you know some internal conversation from an from a, a backbencher. You know that that will be fed up, yeah. sort of angry. I'm going to lose my seat conversation happens and this is why. So, you know, it, it does make a difference and it can yeah. steer the um, government away. Um, and one thing I would also add is people get um, very frustrated when they write to their MPs because what you normally get back is a, a boilerplate letter, which has obviously come from Conservative Central Office that says, oh no, you shouldn't worry at all about this legislation. It's all going to be absolutely wonderful. So it's very, very frustrating. And it's very tempting to think, well, my letter didn't have an effect. But actually we know behind the scenes, it has an effect. It worries them and it, it prompts those internal discussions and that can prompt the U-turns. What I'd add to that as well is if you are sending letters, trying to put as much sensible facts in there as possible so that they, they can't use plate if you're saying well actually look this was said in the house commons you can side on this or this polling shows this it makes it a lot harder to use the boilerplate letter but one of the flaws is when you can see at times the mass campaign letter which can be incredibly effective showing numbers of people but also can get filtered out from conservative mps quite well any mp quite a lot you see with some mps their automatic response will actually already say we automatically delete <laughs> Um, mass communications hmm. so it's personalising stuff and just making sure there's enough in there that they can't just use a stock response to you is always a good way to really make them think okay I've actually got to this is a problem now it's a problem for them personally I yeah. think uh, write that letter but also put and I'm copying it into my local press yes <laughs> and yeah. posting it on my local so, local town social media or whatever just to ratchet yeah. up the leverage a little bit We've got, sorry, we've got some questions in the chat now. The first from Liz Pohl. Aren't they shouting these things because that this is about the, the, the dog whistle issues because they're wedge issues and it forces the opposition to focus on them rather than bread and butter leader, le, bread and other issues, leadership, international standing issues, etc. that people would actually vote on? If I can, I'm going to be quite controversial on this one. I think this is more of a problem for the opposition than it is for, in regards to the government because Conservatives have always been very, very good at telling the public what the public should be thinking. Whether that's what they are thinking or not is irrelevant. The, the way they frame messages, they make it seem like, well, this is what the voice of the people want. This is what the public want. So they are creating the narrative. For it. And I think we need the opposition to start doing the same thing almost, because what we see is a lot of times go, oh, well, this is what the public wants, so we've got to go in line with this. When actually the polling shows it's not what the government public wants at all. It's what 
the Conservatives have told people the public want and get out into the media enough. So it's trying to shape that. So a lot of these things, the majority of people in the country do not care about the culture wars. The majority of people do not think that the word woke has any relevance to their lives. And this is consistent polling showing. But it's been framed so well as this is the voice of the people, but the opposition then feels it has to respond as if it is, rather than turning around and saying, well, no, actually, it's a voice of about 10 of your members. Um, most people don't really care about this. Let's focus on the actual issue here. Hmm. I think that's where we need that framing. I think that's very, very perceptive. I think getting back control of the people's priorities nonsense is absolutely key. I think that's a very, that's a very good, very strong message. Um, from Rachel Marshall, what defence do we have about the sheer pace of this government and its legislation? It seems impossible not to be constantly on the back foot. Very good question. Yeah. <laughs> want to have a good it, it is a very, very good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it, it is extraordinary, the pace um, of legislation and the pace of truly dreadful legislation that, you know, if you, if you look at the contents of the Queen's speech, it's not just hinting, because it, it never is really explicit about what they're going to do, but it gives you clues. It doesn't just hint at one dreadful piece of legislation, it hints at half a dozen. So whereas you might expect that you would have um, per session one piece of legislation you're going to have to fight against. Actually, you have to choose now because they've got three or four really dreadful things and you have to try and work out, well, which, which is the one which is going to be easiest to defeat. It's, uh, it, it, it's a very, I think it must have been a very carefully prepared strategy to do that. There is a, oh, sorry. Uh, there, is, there is a bit of a theory that um, they, they waited until they had a, a big majority and they've been waiting quite some time because and they'd learned this strategy from 1997 from new labor all of that legislation was able to be put through now of course it doesn't really there's not really much of a comparison anymore they've done far more um and far more quickly but I, I i completely agree with mark i think it was a deliberate strategy the reason it was so confusing it was even difficult to talk to mps about it because they would be confused between the policing bill or the elections bill everybody was confused and it was designed like that what i don't think they anticipated and um was how well all of the organizations who care about this thing worked together or separately i think mm. it was a very good a way of working i think it, there was a real delineation on who was going to focus on different bills you know with people working hard on nationality and borders bill others working on the elections bill and even though there were sort of several different groups having those conversations the work was was divided up pretty nicely and I think we should be pleased about how how some of that went even if some of it wasn't the overall uh you know wasn't the the result we wanted especially on all the amendments we tried to get in the only thing I would uh you know yeah um some of this I think the, the a lot of this is used for culture war issues and I think this has worked up until now because people haven't, you know, up until now, a lot, the, the majority of people haven't had to worry too much about their electricity bills and the, the, the cost of food. I think there is a big test for their strategy now because let's see if this still works. If you still want to talk to everybody about immigration, LGBT rights, and various other issues that might drive a wedge in some, you know, in some parts of the country and in certain demographics. Let's see how much these people really want or even prepared to entertain listening to this while they feel they've got so little money in their pocket. And it's been so clear that the government's done nothing to, to help or alleviate these problems. So I think we, we will see this, this strategy, but the wheels may come off this strategy mm. uh, as, as yeah. pressure bites. So we, I think we have to see if this is going to continue, if they're going to be able to continue doing this. And just to add, agree fully with, Callum Mark, and I think the wheels will come off it. But we also, as a you know, wider issue for ourselves, have to also know when not to go after something and when to stay laser focused. Um, from mm. dealing with refugees, for example, I saw some great organisations who I fully respect and had come when they were talking about sound cannon channel and wave machines. Like, guys, that can never happen anyway. Can that's to deflect from focusing on. So it's knowing when are they actually just throwing bait out 
so it completely distracts you and when do you have to go right i'm going to ignore that and stay focused on this and that's why this council has been really good of how organizations are working so closely together but also staying very much of okay if you're focused on that area we're focused on that area so no one's getting too overwhelmed and we're still being able to tackle different things and talk into better Good advice. Um, we've got two questions from Lyndon. As one of them, I think, will come to at the end because it's about parties working together to get the Tories out. Um, but she's also asked: the right-wing media also plays a part with influencing what people think. How can this be addressed? Anybody got any doctor? This is another very, very difficult question. Actually, we have got an extraordinary media landscape in this country, where between uh, Rupert Murdoch. Frederick Barclay, um, Lord Rothermere, and Yevgeny Lebedev. They own, um, it by readership, about 80% of the media in this country, of, of the print media, and a lot of broadcast media follows the lead of the print media. So, so in this country, we have a much worse situation than many other countries, actually. And you made the point, Anthea, about the Overton window. Uh, that's a real problem because they sh they can shift the Overton window. They can do the dirty work for the politicians and shift the Overton window so that what, what would have been um, unthinkable for a politician to say three years ago even um, becomes perfectly acceptable because the way has been paved by the media. Um, I think there are some uh, things that are hopeful. There are new media springing up, um, things like New European, uh, obviously the um, Byline Times Network and West Country Voices and, uh, and so on. Um, those are sp springing up and, and growing reasonably well, um, uh, but very small in comparison. The other thing which um, they have against them is reality. Uh, Cal's already mentioned one of them, the cost of living crisis is reality. It doesn't really matter what the Daily Mail tells me. If I can't afford uh, to pay the heating bills, actually, I might stop buying the Daily Mail either. Uh, so uh, the, a collision with reality is difficult, even, even for a, a, a very strong um, media coalition in effect to deal with. And, and the other thing is the pure numbers, that the number of people in this country who really are in favor of this market fundamentalist agenda is tiny. It's probably just a few thousand people who would really like to see the UK turned into um, some uh, dystopian capitalist fantasy land. Um, and there are therefore about 68 million people who wouldn't like to do that if they understood it. And we all, those of us who, who, who see the risk, we all know a lot of decent people who are not yet fully aware of the dangers. And if, if each of us who does understand it could, could just explain it to two other people, suddenly it's gone viral. And the, if we've learned one thing in the last few years, it's what a virus can do. So I think both, both reality and the numbers are two things which are very big and very difficult for them to handle. I'd, I'd just like to add a little bit on, on while we're talking about press, or in this case, sort of sources of information. It's worth it's worth thinking about the fact that people under 25 and then that's an increasing, as time goes on, that's more people who might be able to vote in, a, in the next general election, are getting their news pretty much entirely from sources like TikTok, from Instagram and, and other places like that. And at the moment, uh, and I certainly don't want to put, uh, you know, start by discussing any unproven conspiracy theories, but the influence of, uh, of uh, on those platforms is, is untested and, and not fully understood yet. So TikTok, there have been concerns about the fact that that is owned by a, a Chinese organisation. Uh, I think we, this is either an optimistic point or a very pessimistic point. We, this is either a tool that will help us overcome the, the grit that right wing media has, or it's a completely different threat that we don't yet uh, fully <laughs> don't yet fully understand. Actually, I think it's a bit of both mm. uh, because I think uh, there is no doubt that, um, for example, on Twitter, you can see there there are lots of people who are able to do a lot of good work in um, 
uh, in debunking some, some of these myths and so on. But on the other hand, um, the Brexit campaign was largely waged with very sophisticated psyops using social media, in particular Facebook. Um, and the technology's moved on since then. Uh, it's, it's more advanced. And I think the online harms bill will make it easier for the government actually to do that sort of thing if we're not very, very careful. So it, 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 it's, it's almost like an arms race between the two sides. Both, both of those things that you said, Cal, I think are true. And the question is really just which one, which one becomes stronger, faster? I think the other um, thing is that we very, very much live in our, in our bubbles, however much we try and break out of them. And I don't know if any of you ever spend, if you cross over onto the dark side of Twitter, the other, it's a very frightening place. And you suddenly mm. realize there's a whole parallel universe where a whole alternative truth is believed. And, yeah. you know, it's pretty dark and, and you know, dirty. And, mm. and we find ourselves battling, you know, on Facebook, really, uh, it, it pains us to give money to Meta. But often it's the only because we do do target, you know, we we put mm. our ads out and we target certain demographics. You know, if it's an M, if you know, Tiverton Honiton, obviously we targeted Tiverton Honiton uh, residents mm. when we're doing articles then. But it's it, you have to, yeah, you have to use the system and you have to give them more money, which is very, very, you know, mm. displeasing to say the least. <laughs> uh, there is a positive, I'd say, by the way, that can be forgotten at times. And this is a roundabout way of looking at a positive, and maybe if I might be trying to grasp at silver linings. The negative to start with is the UK right wing press is, well, the UK press in general is known across Europe. It has the largest power to have a negative influence and increase hostility against different demographics. And that's been done by numerous studies looking at the language that's used and how it influences. But it is also the most self-centered and self-directed media. It said it's a very limited number of people own the majority, and they are solely out for what they can do. We saw with Johnson how you started to even see things like the Telegraph and even the Daily Mail or a couple of starting to turn on them because the conservatives push it too far where it goes against the interests of the owners. I and mean, it's a strange way to look at it, but they could end up effectively eating themselves up by everyone looking at this going, well, hang on, if I'm meant to believe the government who you've told me to believe all this time, but now the government's saying that you're wrong and you're saying they're wrong, who do I believe? And that allows that slide in for the neutral more, well, actually, guys, this is what's happening and here are the facts. So you see, watching them turn on each other occasionally and it's growing could be the potential way that we see an avenue in overcoming the hold of it yeah well actually to be positive. <laughs> well actually we're seeing it in action with this leadership debate aren't we i mean the these two candidates are basically demolishing the conservative party in plain sight <laughs> you know and writing the script for and i'm there's bazillion labor ads you know where they've spelt out how they failed so yes yeah, sometimes that, that it can play, play to our advantage right question from colin gordon there's been some good large scale coordination of citizen organizations in the recent campaigns, e.g. on the police bill. Can we talk about what the key forums we're working through to sustain this? Good question. Yeah. Well, it's a bit, yeah, look, I mean, I think we are all, we've got to accept that we're always going to wish there was more cooperation going on or things were a bit more organized. I think let's, let, <laughs> we're never gonna get to a, a perfect situation. And the reason we all feel like that is because we see lots of incredibly good work happening in lots of different parts of the country, different organizations um, uh, and everything else. I think um, that uh, at Best of Britain, we are lucky to, to be, you know, we get included in, in, in a fair few of those conversations, whether they're on Slack channels or whether they're even on Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups or anything else like that. Um, and for obviously organisations like um, West Country Voices and bringing people together. It's difficult to say there has been, I mean, at, at one stage, there were about three pretty similar groups all working on the elections bill, which I had a very odd Venn diagram of the different organisations in it. 
I think that some people are better at organising different things. We're going to have to accept that it's probably going to be a bit like that. And it, it, I, I don't have a better, happier answer. Although what I would say is I think that the, the political situation has changed a bit to when we were fighting on European issues. It is clearer now. I think that the, the work that is needed that needs to be done um, and now and in an election will be a little bit more, I think everybody will land on the same answers. So maybe we, you know, it, it, this will happen fairly naturally um, because the political situation is, is so different and it's just so clear that we've got to get rid of these people who are driving the country into the ground and doing all of this terribly anti-democratic stuff. But I don't have a particularly solid answer on how we get absolutely everybody in the same channels, but I think it's just really important to foster goodwill among organisations as much as possible, which is what we try to do, which is everybody's going to be, I, I know it sounds silly, but actually everybody's got to be quite nice to each other wherever they possibly can um, and make sure everybody's uh, playing fairly and openly. Um, but I do see more of that than I certainly have in for, you know, for years now, which is good news. Yeah. Yeah, I think an eyes on the prize mentality is absolutely key, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think, you know, the stakes are much, much higher in this next election than in any um, election, certainly in my lifetime. Um, if, if this government is returned for another term, there might not be anything resembling a fair election at the end of that term. So this could be the last, the last time. And I think more and more organizations are aware of how high the stakes are. And that I think is uh, making it easier for them to cooperate because they don't, they realize they don't have to agree on everything because they can agree on that. Um, and if you think about it, let's suppose your, your only real concern is climate change. Well, the answer is still going to be the same. We have to get this government out at the next election if we want climate change tackled. If you only really care about poverty, it's still the same answer. We have to get this government out because otherwise poverty is going to get worse. So, so there's a whole raft of organisations who might not naturally have thought of themselves as bedfellows, but who will all gravitate to that same answer. And that, I think, helps with the coordination and collaboration. Right. Um, Daniel, did you want to say something? Um, just, I agree with that entirely, but also it's, again, it's not right and left anymore. You're seeing the Adam Smith Institute recently has just come out quite heavily against both CELAC and Trust. So it's finding those areas of cooperation to show, you know, even people go, oh, well, I consider myself conservative. Yes, you might, but how do you, are you willing to watch the country effectively get destroyed um, in order to ena enable this government because do they really represent anything believing in these days? And that's the thing, it's looking at those in individual issues. You end up, as Mark said at the time, some very strange bedfellows, but <clears throat> it's what you need to do effectively at this stage because they do have to still have a large majority and statistically the size of majority they Quite 2019 is very, very hard to erode by a second election. That would normally leave you at least two terms, potentially three, with that size of majority. They've managed to spectacularly lose so much support beyond anything that I think any pollster was thinking they would do at the time. And they've managed to lose so much of that majority during their own camp, um, during their own tenure. I believe that they've had the most by election losses of any sitting government in the last 50 years, but don't quote me on that one. There is, um, so yes, there are ways that we can work across the board with all sorts of different groups to keep pushing on them to show that they don't stand for anything anymore. And I think things like Tiverton and Honiton, which is obviously are that they know very much in our, on our turf, really showed people what can happen when people are riled and mm. let's say enough is enough, you know, people will get off their backsides and do something. On, I mean, if you want me to just briefly touch on that, and I know it was a question that I think somebody else had yes. said that, I'm sorry. Yeah. All I would say is that the by-election situations are really good, but, and Best Britain will continue polling this, 
But if we're really very, very honest, we can't replicate this everywhere in a general election situation. We just can't. We can't fund, you know, a by-election works by sending all your activists to one part of the country. And in an election, it's not going to be the same way. And there isn't going to be so much direction from, from, from seasoned campaigners who know what they're doing. And where the polling suggests that there really has to be solid cooperation in large parts of the country is the only thing that really would do it that could be guaranteed is if, if parties do stand down for each other, not in very many places. It does not need to be everywhere. It, need, it should be stressed that actually, and Best of Britain has done a lot of work on what, identifying where this needs to happen. It is really a handful in some cases on a good day. So, it, but it really is, you know, any conversations you have with people in your in, in local parties or in local politics, do hammer that point home. Don't let people, you know, we, we we can't do it. We can't go through another election of everybody thinking, oh, well, this will happen a bit like this, I'm sure. And, and we will run, Best for Britain will run a tactical voting uh, operation. We will direct people to vote in the way that we think is going to make the, the biggest difference. But frankly, the situation is so dire. It is such an emergency for so many people. The cost of living crisis and every other issue we've spoken about. I, it, You know, the opposition parties have got to... They have got to help the people they claim to represent by, in some cases, standing down. It is the only way to truly get it. And and then perhaps we can fix the voting system and never have to do this after this conversation ever again. Yeah. You can go back to absolutely battering bits out of each other, and, you know, <laughs> if you so want to uh, in election situations. So we only need to, to, to get this right once. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is not, a, a general election is a very different beast to, to by-elections, as I'm sure a lot of people on the call appreciate that. But, Absolutely. Uh, and I, I didn't want to imply that that every, you know, that Tibbs and London was replicable, but it no, does no. give people, it does mean that if we say in this seat, let's say in our region, mm. in our counties, there are probably five or six seats that could swing the other way. And we can just say to people, those are the ones where if you really want to make a difference, that's mm. where you can help and that's where you can campaign and that's where you can perhaps reverse a, a, a fat majority. I mean, there must be six other by-elections in the wings, really, um, with, wow. mustn't there? I mean, with, um, yeah. you know, David, what's his face? Mr. Coke. Including potentially Boris Johnson. Including mm. potentially Boris Johnson. Well, highly amusing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Although I think Boris Johnson doesn't win his, his seat under pretty much any modelling that you can find yeah. these days anyway, whether it's an election or, or a by-election, I think maybe we might might one day see the back He's of gone. it. <laughs> Only for him to do something else and appear somewhere else, I'm sure. But, you know, we can dream. Right, another question from Sarah Cowley. Do you think the government will, as they threaten, withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights? And given their willingness to ignore international law and the rules-based order, how much difference will it make if they do? Who wants to grab that one first? I'll, I'll tell that first. I think it depends very much on who wins the election. I think if Liz Truss wins, there's a very, very strong chance. I think if Sunak wins, there's a very strong chance of being weakened. Well, the rights going through, but less of withdrawing entirely. Um, that doesn't mean that either way is better. But what is often overlooked with this debate, though, and particularly by conservative politicians looking to pull out of the ECHR, is that those rights are also guaranteed by other international laws for some of the more key ones. So if they want to pull out of that, the question has been a well, what next? Where are you going next on this? The 2005, I think it was, um, or 2010, Conservative Manifesto suggested, for example, pulling out of the International Refugee Convention. And that was massively unpopular, even amongst the own voters. So it depends on how pragmatic they are and how it's put to, well, okay, why are we coming out of this? And that takes the pragmatism of the individual rather than the whole government. and that, I think, is the question for this Tory leadership. If trust will probably come out, I think Sunak will weaken it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to come in on that? I think that's a shared view. Um, got a comment here from Peter Harbour. Rights are being attacked. Protest works if noticed by the government and by the media. Steve Bray sounds up for rights. He's noticed but doesn't get overwhelming exposure. Would the degree of notice change if Steve had 20 people with him at all hours, 50 people, 100 people? 
I believe numbers would be noticed and the more they're noticed, the more they'll be discussed. Can we build on this? It's quite, it's quite something to have a, a law or clause in law written specifically to exclude you, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's quite something. <laughs> it, it is remarkable, yeah. Uh, I'm not convinced, actually. Um, I think some, some of the most effective protests have been where they've been personalised in, in recent years. And uh, Steve Bray is a very, very good example because he's recognisable. Uh, but obviously, um, on a more global scale, Greta Thunberg, uh, started out with her one uh, girl at the time, um, school strikes. And um, it, paradoxically, I think it might be easier to ignore a group of people and say, well, these are furious lefties or whatever the Daily Telegraph calls them, than it is one person being clear, being very articulate, as both of those examples are, um, and clearly not being violent, clearly not being a mob. It's harder, I think, to um, uh, uh, demonize them. So I, I think there's a huge role for these one person protests. Yeah, I think that's, you know, if you contrast it with Extinction Rebellion or Insulate Britain, where it's got, you know, where the, the fact there isn't a figurehead has made them much easier for the, the press to vilify. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is pretty key. Right. Um, another question. I venture, this is again from Linda Nessa. I venture into the mail online, com oh, you brave person. I venture into the mail online comments territory specifically to check out the alternative view viewpoints. This is a very scary place, I bet. But important to understand the reach and support for extreme views and beliefs held, such as leave Brexit, etc. How do we challenge these viewpoints, which are deeply ingrained? Um, I'm going to say, first of all, Linda, you're incredibly brave. And um, my first advice to anybody is never read the comments section of anything. <laughs> but you also remember that the people who comment on newspaper articles are an incredibly small minority of people. And you're not going to get through to everybody all the time. There are always going to be people who their views are so ingrained that it's a sad fact of life. You aren't going to sway that view. But most people tend to swing on their views depending on the circumstances. So you do have the ability to work with the majority. So then you gradually chip away at that minority and decrease it over time as you show with fact. Not, but it's not just fact, it's about how you put them. It's got to, again, going back to what I said before, uh, appealing to people's personal values, appealing to their, what's important to them and not dismissing what's important. One of the key things, at least in my area of migration and refugees, is to say, well, hang on, how come people are getting asylum seekers, getting houses and hotel benefits when there are people living on the street? And you start thinking, well, yeah, and that's actually, I can understand why people who are in dire situations are concerned about that. So you have to then counter that by going, well, we actually spend the vast majority of costs on detention and deportation. If we put that into the local community, benefit everybody then you can start to support it. So it's turning the narrative around to make sure it appeals to what's important to them and why should they care with your opinion and what you're aiming to just achieve. But you aren't always going to get to everybody in Daily Mail's comment section. Perfect example of some of the ones who you unfortunately probably won't ever be able to reach. We always said to people on street stalls, you know, just as you wouldn't change your mind, they won't change theirs and don't waste your time on it. It's just, um, there's a lot of stress and worry for no, for no dividend at all. Um, right, uh, from Colin again, lots of respect for Best of Britain and its focused approach, but the reply about coordination wasn't particularly helpful. People here should maybe, be, should be maybe made aware of the Democracy Network and the Democracy Defence Coalition and check out if they're worth joining and supporting. I mean, they have both of those organisations have used the Best of Britain's office space uh, for the meeting. So those conversations are happening and we're very pleased to help facilitate those. They And um, I think you'll see that the organisations in there are probably ones that everybody in this call has already signed up to. So they were, I mean, the work that some people in that was absolutely essential for the elections bill and formed the basis of, of some fantastic uh, so in fact, well, a lot of the amendments that were tabled were as a direct result of that work. Um, so I'm sure that we'll continue being part of that. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, question from Liz Pohl. Um, just talking about the the tactical voting issue or the co or cooperation standing down etc in that case why not only direct people to vote tactically in the constituencies that count for more impact Somerton and Froome is the one that's coming up with David Warburton of course uh, it should be because he's been off the scene although he must have been able to vote in the leadership election which is interesting um, so that's the most likely by election next I mean, with a, with Bastard Britain has never made recommendations in every seat. There's lots of parts of the country where we wouldn't make a recommendation. And for this, for any election that happens anytime soon, the number will be even smaller, actually. The, the, the parts of the country where there is a benefit from tactical voting. Um, just, just to explain why that is, Best for Britain is one of the few organisations that polls where votes go if certain candidates don't stand all over the country, which is very it's crucial because, of course, people will say, oh, we're round here, the Lib Dem vote goes Tory or it goes green or goes over here. And actually, we measure that um, and make sure we know where that goes. And we really ask people and we've got a process for exactly asking the right way to, to get to, right to, to, to the point on that. So, yeah, no, um, Liz is right. Um, we certainly, <laughs> it certainly won't be a case of everywhere in the country. And ideally, it will be in as few places as possible. Um, but I, and I think that's the consensus that, that everybody is getting towards as well, which is good. Right. right. OK, well, I'm conscious of the time. So but what we like to try and leave uh, people with is an action they can take, something they can do. So they can go away from this thinking, yeah, OK, I'm fired up. I'm going to go and do something now. So I'm going to if each of you would give a, a farewell kind of go and do this message, that'd be great. Cal, do you want to start as you're on? Yeah, I think I will I will cheat a bit and say what I said before, but I would get the contact details for your local newspaper, especially if you're in a conservative seat and make that point about state overreach, have a little look at things that David Davis and other conservatives have said and make sure that that is the point that is being directed to conservative MPs. And best for Britain will keep working out what the best messaging for conservatives is. But I think for now, that's a good starting point. Brilliant, thank you. Mark? Uh, well, I would invite people to uh, take a look at the 99% website and sign up. Um, if you sign up, you get a weekly newsletter. So uh, apart from anything else, you, you get um, some detailed analysis on some, some of these issues that we've, we've talked about today. So if, if you haven't got time to be more active, it's still useful just to get that. Um, but for people who have got time and would really like to help, then we've got six projects going on at the moment. And um, we are an all volunteer organization, so we don't have any paid staff at all. We've got about 3,300 members and they do everything. And so we are reliant on members volunteering their time and effort. And um, so when you look on the website and you see what's been done, that's all been done by our members. And so we would welcome more members, more engaged in the projects to help to drive these changes. Daniel. And my advice would be, don't focus on the negatives. There are wins. We might not have as many at times, but we do see things where positive changes are available and it's stuff we can build on. So it's very easy to look at the news and get distraught and going, right, what's the point? And that's the worst place to be. And you have to look at, well, hang on, things do get better. There are changes. We've just seen... Obviously, I talk about refugee stuff, so um, the Parliamentary Committee has just really hammered the Rwanda policy on so many levels. It's made it virtually impossible for it to even hit the courts without being found to be illegal. So there are solutions out there, but you have to keep looking at them and not getting too bogged down at times in the losses, just focus on the wins at times to keep yourself going. And working with grassroots organisations to do that as well to build up that momentum. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And we would say at West Country Voices, obviously, please um, support us, read us, share the stories, try and get us out beyond the bubble so that um, the, the issues that we're covering are read by people who have who get their news from other sources. And and I think um, a really, really good point was made by Mark about in the next election, 
the, the number of sweet spots to drive people away from voting Conservative are so many that you will almost certainly find that your, your neighbour, your friend, your whatever, who's on, who was on the opposite side or, or, or even maybe couldn't even be bothered to vote, will be mobilised to vote this time because there will be something that's going to hit them personally, for sure. So God bless the Conservatives for that. They certainly. <laughs> and again, the other thing I wanted to, I also want to make clear is that we are not like Best for Britain or any of these other organisations. We are not specifically anti-conservative at all. We're anti Johnson's Conservatives. We're anti this Conservative government, which is, let's face it, Blue Kip has been thoroughly infiltrated, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure that come the come the much needed electoral form, that party will split maybe three ways but it's it can't stay that big tent is full of some very very must be full of some very uncomfortable people now mm. indeed so um and just a final comment from um sarah cowley very interesting and useful discussion thank you for organizing it and thanks to all the contributors and speakers for sharing their experience and i'm sure that everybody on this call and those people who watch the video later will share that thank you very much for giving up your time it's really really appreciated and um, yeah, let's just go and um, take the battle, take the fight to the. On we go. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much, much indeed. indeed. Thanks, everybody, and thank you for being here. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Lucky it didn't clash with the football, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs>